enter Philemon. From December 26, 1913 through May 24, 1914, Jung continued to follow the same procedure of inducing fantasies in a waking state and entering into dialogue with the figures that emerged. An important figure was Philemon, who first appeared on January 27th of 1914. As a pensioned magician from whom Jung's eye had sought to learn the art of magic, in retrospect, Jung recalled that Philemon represented superior insight and was like a guru to him. He would converse with him in the garden. He recalled that Philemon evolved out of the figure of Elijah who had previously appeared in his fantasies. Philemon brought with him an Egyptian Gnostic Hellenistic atmosphere, a really Gnostic hue, because he really was a pagan. He was simply a superior knowledge and he taught me psychological objectivity and the actuality of the soul. He had showed this disassociation between me and my intellectual object. He formulated this thing which I was not and formulated and expressed everything which I had never thought. In the years that followed, Jung sought instruction from this imaginal figure and tried to fathom his nature. The fantasies between December 26 and the first half of the entry for April 19 form the basis of the second book of Liber Navis, Liber Segundus. The material from the second half of the entry of April 19th onward would later form the basis of the third book, Scrutinies. The fact that Jung would later end the manuscript of Liber Secundus here indicates that this marks something of a culmination of the process that he had been engaged in. The entries up to the first half of the entry for April 19 lead to a return to an acceptance of his being alone with himself. His soul had ascended to heaven and he was left alone with his eye, which he now had to learn to live with. This suggests that a certain self-acceptance had been achieved. The following day, April 20th, 1914, Young resigned as president of the International Psychoanalytics Association. Ten days later, he resigned from the medical faculty at, of the University of Zurich, where he had been a lecturer. In memories, he recalled that he felt that he was in an exposed position at the university and that he had to find a new orientation as it would otherwise be unfair to teach students. The entries in the Black Book that immediately follow take up the task of the confrontations with his eye, of learning of how to live with himself. In May, he attempts to reconnect with his soul, seeking further counsel as to how to proceed. In June of, and July of 1914, he had a thrice repeated dream of being in a foreign land and having to return home quickly by ship followed by a descent of the icy cold. On the Ivernavis, he recounted these as follows. In the year 1914, in the month of June, at the beginning and end of the month, and at the beginning of July, I had the same dream three times. I was in a foreign land and suddenly overnight and right in the middle of summer, the terrible cold descended from space. All seas and rivers were locked in ice. Every green living thing had frozen. The second dream was thoroughly similar to this, but the third dream at the beginning of July went as follows. I was in a remote English land. It was necessary that I return to my homeland with a fast ship as speedily as possible. I reached home quickly. In my homeland, I found that in the middle of the summer, a terrible cold had fallen from space, which had turned every living thing into ice. There stood a leaf-bearing but fruitless tree, whose leaves had turned into sweet grapes full of healing juice through the working of the frost. I picked some grapes and gave them a great waiting throng. 
In July of 1910-1914, the Zurich Psychoanalytical Analytical Society voted 15 to 1 to leave the International Psychoanalytic Association. The reason given in the minutes for the succession was that Freud had established an orthodoxy that impeded free and independent research. The group was renamed the Association for Analytical Psychology. Jung was actively actively involved in this association, which met fortnightly. He also maintained a busy therapeutic practice. During 1913 and 1914, he had between one and nine consultations per day, five days a week, with an average of five to seven patients. He also worked on Saturdays, having no or few patients on Thursdays. In 1918, he switched his free day to Saturday. The minutes of the Association for Analytical Psychology gave no indication of the process that Jung was going through. He did not refer to his fantasies, and he continued to discuss the theoretical issues in psychology. The same holds true in his surviving correspondences during this period. Each year, he continued his military service duties. He maintained his professional activities and family responsibilities during the day and dedicated his evenings to his self-exploration. Indications are that this partition of activities becoming continued during the next few years. In memories, Jung recalled that during this period, his family and profession always remained a joyful reality and a guarantee that I was normal and really existed. In July of 1914, Jung was in England to present some lectures. The question of different ways of interpreting fantasies, such as Jung's own, was the subject of a talk he presented on July 24th before the Psychomedical Society in London on psychological understanding. He contrasted Freud's analytical reductive method based on causality with the constructive method of the Zurich School. The shortcoming of the former was that through tracing things back to antecedent elements, only half of the picture was dealt with and the living meaning of phenomena could not be grasped. Attempting to understand Goethe's Faust using Freud's method would be like trying to understand a Gothic cathedral through its mineralogical aspect. The meaning only lives when we experience it and through ourselves. Inasmuch as life was essentially new, it could not be understood merely retrospectively. Hence, it was useful to look at how, out of this present psyche, a bridge can be built into its own future. Jung called this the constructive standpoint. This paper can be read both as Jung's rationale for not embarking on a causal and retrospective analysis of his fantasies and as a caution to those who might be tempted to do so. Presented as a critique, and a reformulation of psychoanalysis, Jung's new, Jung's new mode of interpretation linked back to the symbolic method of Swedenborg's spiritual hermeneutics. On July 28th, Jung gave a talk on the importance of the unconscious in psychopathology. At a meeting, at a meeting of the British Medical Association in Aberdeen, he argued that in cases of neurosis and psychosis, the unconscious attempted to compensate the one-sided conscious attitude. The unbalanced individual defends himself against this, and the opposites become more polarized. The corrective impulses that present themselves in the language of the unconscious should be heralded the beginning of a healing process, but the form in which they break through makes them unacceptable to unconscious to consciousness. A month earlier, on June 28, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated by the student Gavrilo 
a 19 year old Bosnian serf. On August 1st, war broke out. Young returned from Scotland by ship. He first went to Holland, concerned for the safety of Maria Molzer, and accompanied her back to Switzerland, as he narrated in Liver Novice. In reality now, it was so. At the time, when the Great War broke out between the people of Europe, I found myself in Scotland, compelled by the war to choose the fastest ship and the shortest route home. I encountered the colossal cold that froze everything. I met up with the flood, the sea of blood, and found my barren tree whose leaves the frost had transformed into a remedy. And I plucked the ripe fruit and gave it to you, and I do not know what I poured out for you. What bittersweet, intoxicating drink which left on our tongues an everlasting, an ever taste, an aftertaste of blood. Years later, he told Mauricia Elaide, As a psychiatrist, I became worried, wondering if I was not on the way to doing a schizophrenia, as we said in the language of those days. I was just preparing a lecture on schizophrenia to be delivered at the Congress in Aberdeen, and I kept saying to myself, I'll be speaking of myself. Very likely I'll go mad after reading out this paper. The Congress was to take place in July 1914, exactly the same period when I saw myself in my three dreams voyaging on the southern sea. On July 31st, immediately after my lecture, I learned from the newspaper that war had broken out. Finally, I understood. And when I disembarked in Holland on the day, on the next day, nobody was happier than I. Now, I was sure that no schizophrenia was threatening me. I understood that my dream and my visions came to me from the subsoil of the collective unconscious. What remained for me to do now was to deepen and validate this discovery, and this is what I have been trying to do for 40 years. Jung thought that his fantasy had depicted what would happen not to himself but to Europe, that it was a precognition of a collective event, what he would later call a big dream. After this realization, he attempted to see whether and to what extent this was true of the other fantasies that he experienced, and to understand the meaning of this correspondence between his private fantasies and public events. He took the outbreak of the war as a sign that his fear of going mad was misplaced. It is no exaggeration to say that had war not been declared, Liber Novice would in all likelihood not have been compiled in 1954, while discussing active imagination, Jung said that the reason why the involvement looks very much like a psychosis is that the patient is integrating the same fantasy material to which the insane person falls victim because he cannot integrate it but is swallowed up by it. What of Jung's fantasies did he regard as precognitive? It is important to note that there were around 12 separate events the first and second being in October of 1913, where he had repeated vision of floods and death of thousands, and the voice that said that this will become real. The second vision of the sea of blood covering the Northern Ireland. The fourth sign of de in December 12th of 1913, where there was an image of a dead hero. December 15th, Fifth sign, on 1913, the slaying of Siegfried in a dream. Sixth, on December 25th of 1913, the image of a foot of a giant stepping on a state and images of murder and bloody cruelty. The seventh, on January 2nd of 1914, with the sea of blood and enormous dying. The 8th on January 22nd of 1914, his soul comes up from the depths and asks him if he will accept the war and destruction. She shows him images of destruction, military weapons, human remains, sunken ships, destroyed states, and so forth. 
the 9th, on May 21st of 1914, he hears a voice saying that the sacrifice fall left and right. The 10th and 12th, from June to July of 1914, dream repeated three times of being in a foreign land and having to return quickly by ship and the descent of the icy cold. 